Contrary to popular belief, even though doctors go through years and years of training, we are just mere mortals like you. And we struggle every day to get the diagnosis right. You see, when a doctor evaluates a patient, we perform the physical examination. It's the laying on of the hands, and it's been going on for over 2,000 years since the time of Hippocrates. And we're trying to figure out what could be wrong with the organs that lie beneath your skin. And really, other than the stethoscope that came along in 1816, there really hasn't been anything that's come along to change the way we take care of patients at the bedside. But in 1965, the world witnessed the birth of ultrasound right there on the cover of Life magazine. But these initial machines were enormous. They took 10 minutes to boot up, they weighed hundreds of pounds, and they were very expensive, and therefore, they were not very portable. But just look over the last 30 years how portable these machines have become. I mean, some of them run on a battery. You can fit them right in your pocket. And this has enabled us to perform ultrasound now on all kinds of new settings and locations. When we use it in this way, we term it point-of-care ultrasound because we can use it anywhere a patient is being taken care of. Now, that might be in the ER or the OR or the ICU, but it could be in a really far-flung place like up at the space station or on a cruise ship or even in a remote African village. Now, currently, the other way to look into the body is with a CT scan. And a CT scan is just like an X-ray, except instead of just getting one X-ray, it's like 500 X-rays of radiation. Both the World Health Organization and the CDC classifies X-rays as carcinogenic. Imagine standing in front of an X-ray machine now and pulling the trigger on yourself 500 times, okay? Why do doctors love these things so much? Well, the truth that no one says is that the healthcare system, because it's gotten so complicated, for doctors to keep up, they have to see so many more patients now. Meanwhile, we're being held to higher and higher levels of accountability that the only way to not miss anything is to just CT everything that walks in the door. Sadly, that's the state of modern healthcare, and no, it's not very patient-centered. It's better to limit the use of CT scans only when their benefit outweighs the risk of their cumulative radiation. So this is Dr. Abraham Verghese from Stanford University, and doctors around the world look up to him. He wrote an article in the New York Times called the Stanford 25. It's the 25 things every Stanford medical student's got to be able to do with the physical examination. It got us thinking at UCI. Could we do a point-by-point -point comparison integrating ultrasound into this? And indeed we did, and we dubbed it the UCI 30. It's the 30 ultrasound applications that my UCI medical students can do at the bedside with ultrasound. And everything from the eyeballs to the ankles and all the organs in between are seen in much better resolution and accurately compared to the physical examination. And what's best of all, there's no radiation. It's just sound waves. So I want to tell you about a case of mine that I had so you can get an idea as how we struggle to get it right as doctors. She was a 22-year-old female. The neighbors saw her out in front of her house. They thought she was having an asthma attack. She's lying there unconscious. And when the paramedics brought her to me, I'm thinking asthma attack, and I'm listening to her lungs. She's, her skin is this ashen gray blue color, but her lungs are clear. Now things aren't adding up, and so a medical student suggests, hey, maybe we should do an ultrasound to check for internal bleeding because she was found outside. You know, maybe she was hit by a car. I thought, not a bad idea. So we put the ultrasound machine on her, and we see this. This is bleeding between the liver and the kidney. And yeah, maybe she was hit by a car. We're seeing all this bleeding here. So we cut the rest of her clothes off, checking for any signs of trauma. There's no bruises, no scratches, no cuts, nothing. So why would this 22-year-old woman who has no signs of trauma have all this internal bleeding? Well, it turns out that 2% of the time, pregnancies don't implant in the uterus where they're supposed to, but they plant outside in one of the fallopian tubes. And when they grow large enough, they outgrow the fallopian tube and the big blood vessels that supply it, rupturing those blood vessels. 
So we go ahead and perform an ultrasound. We want to see inside the pelvis. We perform an internal ultrasound, and this is what we see. You can, on the left side of the monitor there, that's the bleeding coming from the ruptured blood vessel. It's swirling around in her pelvis. Now, our next question is, who's going to take care of this? We call OBGYN, and they ask us one question. What does the pregnancy test show? A fair question, but the patient's only been in my ER for like three minutes, and so we didn't have a pregnancy test back yet. We did have O-negative blood, however, and we hung that, and the patient did go to the operating room, and they stopped the bleeding and saved her life. So this case, it went from asthma attack to internal bleeding to ruptured tubal pregnancy, all because of this curious medical student who instinctively wants to do ultrasound any chance they get. I mean, can you see why I become such a sono evangelist? So what is the current state of this ultrasound revolution? I can tell you that the current technology has outpaced the training of the physicians. You see, ultrasound can be a bit of an art to perform. Experts make it look easy, but really it takes quite a bit of training and time to make these machines sing to you. Okay, so we embarked upon a radical concept at UCI. Let's start the ultrasound training right in the beginning of a medical student's four-year journey to become a doctor. So that by graduation, all medical students, regardless of whatever specialty they ultimately match into, are adept with this new skill. So this is another case I had, and this guy I really did almost kill. He was a 70-year-old gentleman. He was brought in by the paramedics, and I was working on the south side of Chicago. It was, it was busy. It was loud. I was getting interrupted like every 15 seconds by all kinds of mini emergencies, you know. And they bring this guy in. I'll never forget it. He was sitting up in the gurney, and the paramedic said, oh, yeah, he was choking. And then the, the bystander comes along, does the Heimlich maneuver, but he looks pretty good now. He did look good. He was sitting up, and he wheels right by me. He goes, hey, doc. And I thought to myself, all right joking, probably here for some reassurance. Uh, this is uh, somebody I'm probably going to send home in about 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes later, a, a, one of my resident trainees comes up to me and says, hey, I'm really worried about that guy. I think that the bystanders and the paramedics, I think they got it wrong. You know, I'm talking to the guy and he says, I'm eating dinner and the next thing I know, I'm on the ground and someone's doing the Heimlich maneuver on me. Dr. Fox, I think we got to change our algorithm from choking to passing out. Now, initially, I was a little skeptical. After all, I was about to send this guy home, but I did. I went to the bedside, and I, and I performed an, an examination on this very well-appearing gentleman who was in no acute distress. And when I got down to his abdomen, and I pushed on it, he goes, yep, that's it, doc, right there. That's, that's, I mean, that's where they did the Heimlich maneuver on me. That's, why it's, that's where they squeezed me. He kind of wrote it off a little bit too quickly for me, and that raised my suspicion for something called abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is a condition in which your abdominal aorta, the biggest blood vessel in your body, balloons out, kind of like taking a garden hose and stretching it really thin, turning the pressure on, you see it ballooning out there. That's what can happen to your aorta. And before it ruptures, it leaks. And when it leaks, your blood pressure has a sudden drop, causing you to pass out. But then you wake up, and you actually do pretty well until it ruptures. Once it ruptures, 80% of the time, you die. And so... We go ahead and we perform an ultrasound on this guy, and this is the image here. That black thing in the middle, that's the aneurysm. And we are very excited. We're moving the probe around really quickly here because we made the diagnosis, and now we know we have a ticking time bomb on our hands. 60 seconds after we took this video, we called vascular surgery, and the patient was taken to the operating room where he did rupture. But a skilled team saved his life. And I almost sent this guy home. It really, it was the ultrasound machine. In, in that way, it lowers my threshold to pick up life-threatening conditions because it's just right there. You know, it's, it's always available to me, and that's what I love about it. So one of the most common questions I get is the medical school curriculum is already so impacted with so much important stuff. How are you going to cram even more skills in there? And my answer is simple, active learning. You see, currently, the way medical school is taught, there's a professor at the bottom of the classroom bestowing his knowledge on a large group of people, which is a super convenient way to teach a large group of people. But a more modern approach is to flip that classroom, meaning you make a podcast out of the didactic material and you flip it into the cloud so that the students 
come ready to class to put probe to patient, actively learning about the organs and anatomy and physiology and pathology. When a student sees the organs come to, come to life on ultrasound with their interconnected vascular road, roadmaps highlighted by color Doppler, they're learning anatomy and physiology in a very active way. When they see how the muscles tug on the tendons which are attached to the bones and the joints and they're learning body mechanics in an active way. When they see the heart in its four chambers pumping together on ultrasound and how a little, a little pathology in the valve throws it all into chaos, they're learning that in an active way that the stethoscope could simply never do. Okay, so now we have all these small groups of students together. Where are we gonna find all these instructors? Well, there's an old adage in medicine. It's called see one, do one, teach one. Okay, we have senior medical students teaching junior medical students. Now, before you think this is some gimmicky way the deans came up with to save some money, you know, here, it's, it, think again, because ever try to explain something to somebody that you think you, you knew cold, only to find out you have no idea what you're talking about? Okay, that's what Aristotle's saying with teaching is the highest form of understanding. When my medical students can teach each other how to perform ultrasound, I know at that moment, they're ready for the next stage of their training, residency. So what is the future of this ultrasound gonna look like in healthcare? Well, you can imagine going to your primary care doctor and instead of sending you off for a bunch of tests, no, they just reach right into their, their white coat pocket and they pull out their own personal ultrasound imaging device and they perform an ultrasound on you right there in their clinic and they make the diagnosis and direct the appropriate therapy right there on the spot. Now let's fast forward a little bit more into the future. As Moore's Law continues to make these computer chips faster and faster, the machines get better and better, smaller and smaller, and more affordable. Now, because of strong image recognition software, they could direct their user in its own operation, comparing your organs to millions of others in the cloud and finding the pathology, rendering the diagnosis on the spot. I mean, these things could be part of every first aid kit. Is that possible? Well, we already have really strong face recognition software. Ultrasound organs would be the next logical step. It's not too far-fetched. So, I wanna tell you about the case that's made the most impact on me as a physician. The paramedics had rolled this woman into bed five. I just started my shift and she looked sick. The nurses jump into action. They start an IV, they put her on oxygen, they get an EKG. And I go to the bedside and I will never forget this the rest of my life. She reaches up and grabs my hand and says, doctor, I feel like I'm going to die. Don't let me die. Now, her father's in the room and he's asking me what's wrong with my daughter and, I, and, I, and all these diagnostic possibilities start swirling through my head, you know. I mean, could this be uh, s a severe sepsis from, from, a, some, from a bad infection causing septic shock? I don't know, the symptoms came on so, so rapidly and she doesn't have a fever. Could this be a heart attack? Could this be a heart attack? She, she's so young and her EKG looks normal. As I, as I ponder, I wonder what it could be. And you know, she, she is a bus driver and she has a relatively sedentary lifestyle. She, she's a smoker and she recently started taking birth control pills, all these risk factors, along with her chest pain and her shortness of breath, I'm starting to really rally my team behind the diagnosis of a blood clot to the lungs, okay? And now the, the, the father is asking me, what, what do you mean, a blood clot to the lungs? Well, how do you treat that? And I said, well, we have a really good medication. It's a clot-busting drug, and it will, it will bust up that clot in her lungs. But, uh, you know, one in 20 times when I push this drug, the patient experiences bleeding in the brain, and it can kill them. The nurse runs off to get the clot busting drug and then he says to me, well, how can you be, how can you be sure that this is what's going on? I said, well, we could, we could do a CT scan. That's the most accurate test here for sure. But you know, I can't put someone this sick who's got such dangerously low blood pressure over in the CT scanner. That's the last place that you can do a good resuscitation. So we can't, that's not an option. The nurse is now back with the medication. Doctor, it's 100 milligrams IV push over 20 minutes, right? Yes, the father. How can you be sure? I said, well, we can perform an ultrasound of her heart and we can look at her heart. And normally when you look at somebody's heart, the left ventricle 
does the heavy lifting. It's the big chamber of the heart. The right ventricle is more diminutive. It's just pumping blood out to the lungs anyways. But when there's a blood clot in the lung, that right ventricle gets bigger and bigger and bigger while it's trying to pump blood into the lungs. It gets as big or even bigger than the left ventricle. We put the ultrasound on the patient and we see this. Okay, this is not at all what I was expecting. Okay, this is very different than that blood clot problem I told you about. This is simply fluid around the heart that's blocking the heart from filling. This has a very simple fix. I just got to put a needle right in the top of the screen there through that membrane into that sac. Fluid comes out, no problem. However, if we gave the clot busting drug, blood would start pouring out everywhere. She would exsanguinate and die. Excuse me, nurse, did you already push the clot busting drug? No? Good. Get that out of here. Now bring me a big needle. And I did. I drained two Coke cans worth of straw-colored fluid from around this woman's heart. And, you know, we sent off to the laboratory. Two days later, comes back. She has a condition called lupus. Now, the telltale for lupus is usually this butterfly rash on the face. She had that rash, and I missed it. It's embarrassingly, I missed it. I was in the throes of a challenging resuscitation, and I missed it. But, you know, it was the ultrasound that drove me right into the diagnosis and saved her life. What is the truth that no one says? That we, as doctors, need to stop punishing our patients with massive amounts of radiation and get back to the bedside, spending more time with our patients trying to figure it out. And if the answer can come from sound waves and not x-rays, well, then we should be ashamed not to reach for ultrasound first. After all, it was Hippocrates who told us, first, do no harm. Thank you.